every 40 seconds a child goes missing or is abducted in the United States. That's approximately 840,000 children a year that are reported missing. And when an Amber Alert is issued, most reports of missing or abducted children can be resolved in hours. However, the majority of our children are not that lucky. The majority of our children that do go missing do not receive any type of alert. For them, there is no fanfare. For the parents, it's almost like pulling teeth to get their child's case heard. For so many of these children, there is no media coverage, and their case flies under the radar. Many of these cases involve situations where a child goes missing permanently or for an extended period of time. But together, we can change things. Together, we can be a voice for the voiceless. Together, we can be an Amber Alert for the children who get no alert. Please, like share, and subscribe, and let's help bring all the children home. This crime takes place in Cloverdale, a suburb of Surrey, located southeast of Vancouver, British Columbia. It begins when a 10-year-old girl goes missing from outside her home. Hundreds of police and volunteers will search for her. A scientist with a keen sense of observation will unravel her disappearance. October 1st, 2000. A call comes into the RCMP detachment in Surrey at 5.30 p.m. A father reports the disappearance of his daughter. Her name is Heather Thomas. In cases involving missing children, time is of the essence. Police move quickly. A search is organized around the perimeter of the complex where Heather spends weekends with her father. The lead investigator is Constable Peter Cross from the Violent Crimes Division of the RCMP. Statistically, within the first three or four hours, if the child is not found, it becomes highly problematic and you ch chances are you're dealing with a criminal offense. Peter Cross knows that child abduction cases can become very complex. Constable Chris Drotar is also assigned to the investigation. I was a file coordinator. Uh, my, my role was to uh, take in all the information that uh, the investigators generated on the, uh, during the investigation, file it away, uh, review it, uh, determine if there's anything uh, that needs to be done uh, decide a course of action, basically manage the, the paper end of the file. She was uh, a few of her friends and they were playing in the, in the townhouse complex on that, on that afternoon um, in preparations of going back home to her mother uh, around 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the little boys in the complex had uh, received a new bicycle and uh, he was letting the other children in the complex take turns riding it around the, the complex and just enjoying a sunny afternoon. When Heather gets her turn, she rides the bike around the complex. This is the last time she will be seen. When they went out looking for her and couldn't find her, they found the bike that she was borrowed near the front of the complex, probably 50 feet from the main road. And then what struck me at the time was the bike wheel was actually still turning when they found it. So that was significant to me uh, because obviously it puts a bit of a time frame as to, or some, something sudden having happened. I'm not liking this, the situation when I arrive at 11.30 at night. Uh, it's not feeling right, it's, it's feeling like there's, there's more to this. They called us primarily because they thought that dad was acting somewhat peculiar. Constables Cross and Drotar meet with Heather's father. Dad and mom shared custody of Heather and it was Sunday evening so he was in the process of getting them ready to go back to mom's when he discovered that she wasn't late coming in. 
her knapsack was packed and ready to go at the front door. Uh, we spoke to Dad for um, oh, well over an hour, talking to him and running through the, the times as to what had transpired and his daughter going missing. And uh, we determined that it was impossible for him to have done anything. Peter Cross assigns Constable Jeff Parks to talk with Heather's mother. Well, she was distraught. Yeah, she was devastated. Uh, it's a very difficult time. Uh, she presented exactly what you'd expect uh, from, from a mother who just lost her daughter. The police quickly determined that she has no clues to the disappearance of her daughter. A command center is set up near the complex. Within a few hours, the investigation into the disappearance of Heather Thomas reaches extraordinary proportions. Uh, once we got past that initial 12 hours, uh, we were treating it as a suspicious uh, and a possible homicide. The investigative team started expanding and expanding fairly quickly. And I think it eventually grew to 45 or 50 in terms of investigators. What we brought in were uh, people from Surrey Detachment um, and E-Division Major Crime Sections, and they have specific training uh, in generating um, a truthful version of events from children. So we brought them in and uh, to interview all of the friends that were playing uh, in the complex that day with Heather and to determine if they could, uh, if they were a witness to her going missing that day. The townhouse complex where Heather's father lives is searched thoroughly. The RCMP leaves no stone unturned. They went through the parking lot, they recorded all the license plate numbers, and as people got up the next morning, being a Monday morning, we didn't want to miss them and, and any kind of evidence we could find, so we had those people uh, posted there, and uh, they interviewed them as they left, left on their way to work. You have to picture the complex. Uh, there's a lot of kids in the community, so there's people around. Um, across the street is the Cloverdale Fairgrounds, uh, which had the flea market that day, so thousands of people there. Um, and also the racetrack is there. And of course, now you had the police presence, so it became uh, quite a bit at that time. The media presence is growing. They are constantly monitoring police activity and are quick to sniff out a story that will make headlines. This was now gathering in, in quite intense media coverage. Um, and it was getting media coverage, I would say, initially through the West Coast, and then it became uh, nationwide, then it became North America-wide, then it became in Europe even. Investigators immediately discover that the densely populated city of Cloverdale has a disturbing concentration of known sex offenders. There's always suspects. Pick any neighborhood, I'll find suspects. So for instance, if we went and looked at sex offenders living in uh, the Surrey area, uh, we found out we were in the thousands. I, I think there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 uh, sex offenders that lived within a four block radius of where Heather went missing that day. Peter Cross focuses the investigation in a six kilometer radius of the complex. He dispatches investigators to contact all of the 60 known sex offenders. The search to find Heather grows in magnitude and intensity. We're into day three, there is probably six command centers over there, the American authorities, Vancouver City Police. We had police officers volunteering to come in. We had dog sections that came up on their own expense from the states. We had um, bloodhounds from Whatcom County. At the high point, there was 1,200 uh, volunteers coming forward. Peter Cross calls in the RCMP underwater recovery team to search the ponds between Heather's home and the Cloverdale Fairgrounds. There was ponds, water-filled ponds in those areas, and these were uh, in very close proximity to Heather's home. So what we were looking for in the ponds was perhaps Heather had maybe wandered over there and fallen into the pond, so we were, we were thinking that may have been what happened to her. So we were looking for her, and if, if not her, any evidence that uh, connected to that case. 
Peter Cross and his team are buried under a mountain of evidence and reports that all require follow-up. They turned up clothing, uh, socks, pants, shirts. We had a description of what Heather was wearing at that time, but you know everybody was uh, playing it safe. Despite the scale of the investigation, volunteers continue to pour in. Police officers volunteer their time. Everyone involved in the search for Heather Thomas continues to hope. Has Heather been kidnapped by a sexual predator? Could her attacker be hiding among the hundreds of volunteers who are searching for her? On October 1st, 2000, the RCMP begins a search for 10-year-old Heather Thomas, who is missing. She lives in a suburb of Surrey, British Columbia, that is also home to more than 60 sex offenders. Within a few days, more than 1,200 police and volunteers join the search. Lead investigator Peter Cross has extensive knowledge with child abduction cases. He knows that aggressors are often predictable when covering their tracks. One of these modus operandi is what investigators call secondary displacement. Basically what happens is the suspect doesn't feel comfortable with the initial placement of the body and returns to move it again. My thought process at the time is let's shut the searches down, which were pretty extensive by this time. We're operating in theory that it would have to be somebody in that complex or visiting the flea market next door, somebody familiar with the area. Let's shut it down, let them believe the search is over in the hope that that may prompt the suspect to move the body a second time, um, either to a Smith right or something. Um, and then we would go back and research again. The public search is suspended for a few days. Unfortunately, the tactic doesn't pay off and no new clues surface. The team restarts the ground search from where they left off. Investigators continue to follow up on the innumerable leads they have. Some of them are quite unusual and show how the entire community hopes for the safe return of Heather. Uh, we would go to interview a sex offender and he'd already have a statement written out because he said, I know you, you're coming to see me and this is where I was and here it is and they would hand over your statement. So it's a little bit unique circumstances in those cases. 21 days after Heather goes missing, a chilling lead is reported 35 kilometers away from where she was last seen. A hiker in Golden Ears Provincial Park finds what looks like the body of a child along the shore of Alouette Lake. Investigator Peter Cross and his team are alerted and immediately make their way to the scene. By the time we arrived there, it was dusk. Um, the park gates were already closed. And the sides of the roads were lined with, with vehicles, of people and media wanting to know what would happen and if it was in fact Heather. But, you know, you had that sinking feeling. Investigators can only estimate how long the body has been immersed in Alouette Lake. There's no signs of trauma, it just it appeared that she'd been in the water for some time. She was still wearing the, some of the jewelry that we were looking for. The body is identified as Heather Thomas. For the hundreds of volunteers and investigators, this is a very sad conclusion to three weeks of intensive searching. The body is transported to the Royal Columbian Hospital for an autopsy. The following day, Golden Ears Park remains closed and the investigation continues. They had been lowering the levels of the lake. The lake we were seeing that day, at the day that Heather would have gone into the lake, would have been significantly different looking. Alouette Lake is in the heart of Golden Ears Provincial Park. British Columbia's electricity producer has built a hydroelectric dam that connects to the lake. The water levels vary considerably depending on the season and the demand for electricity. 
In fact, the water would have been 40 feet higher up the beach. So considering putting all those factors in play, and we had hydrologists come in and, and were telling us how this all worked. So using those kind of calculations, we were able to say, okay, if we search this beach, we got to search the area that she could have been in water. So it was like a 40 foot size beach area that had to be covered as well. They want us to conduct uh, an underwater search uh, outward and to both sides uh, of where the body was located. Again, just looking for any evidence that might be related to the case. This case is, is unique in that the lake out there was crystal clear. We had 25 feet plus visibility. And again, we were able to search and clear what we refer to as the target area without using any scuba. RCMP divers discover a dark shape in a few meters of water, not far from where Heather's body was found. A big importance for us in our investigation was a windwell hockey bag found in the lake. I believe it was about 20 meters or 25 meters from where Heather was found in the water. In the bag, we recovered some rocks used to weight the bag down. Um, so that, you know, that left us with the opinion that that's how she'd been transported to, to the lake. The, the hockey bag itself had a broken zipper on it, on the top, so it, it left it um, approximately half to three quarters open, so it couldn't uh, completely close her inside of it, so I'm assuming that's how she floated away. In an area of the shoreline that was previously underwater, investigators find more evidence. A number of items were found of Heather's. Uh, what I recall is um, a little bracelet that she had, a little blue, baby blue bracelet that was found on the shoreline. While the investigators continue at Alouette Lake, the autopsy gets underway. We could find no sign of cause of death. Um, no obvious blunt trauma, no obvious uh, wounds like a stabbing or strangulation or anything along those lines. Again, we have to keep into mind the decomposition by this stage. So it's your classic body in a water problem in that it doesn't necessarily help you a lot in terms of figuring out exactly what happened. We took the x-rays and then we got the actual uh, original dental x-rays from Heather's dentist. I think it was about four or five o'clock in the afternoon that, that David Sweet said that this is Heather Thomas. The body is confirmed to be Heather Thomas. Now the missing persons file officially becomes a murder investigation. Jeff Parks thoroughly inspects the sports bag found in the lake near the body. I saw that there was plant material in the bags of the hockey bag and in the bag itself. Uh, what really stood out were the fern leaves, like the, 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 um, they're, they're sword ferns. And that's when I made the connect back to her hair that there's, there's actually, a, this hockey bag can be linked to Heather uh, in more than one fashion. Jeff Parks looks for a specialist who can analyze the plant fragments. Investigators hold a press conference stating that the body discovered in Alouette Lake is indeed Heather Thomas. The announcement generates a very interesting lead. One of the dispatchers in Maple Ridge Detachment was watching it on TV at home. And this lady remembers the day Heather disappeared because she was dispatching at the time in Maple Ridge. She takes the time to go back to the detachment when all this kerfuffle was going on and pull the dispatch ticket. And she said, oh yes, I remember we had this one suspicious vehicle. So she came to a couple of other investigators and said, you know, you may be interested in this. I looked at it and it basically was a possible suspicious vehicle seen at um, Goldnears Park the day of Heather's disappearance. As it turned out, it was park employees that had called in the original complaint. They thought it was suspicious and that the guy had a hoodie over his head. The vehicle was somewhat unique and he was driving so slowly in the park. And then, of course, it's October, so there's not an awful lot of activity in the provincial parks at that time. And um, a little later on, they found the vehicle uh, in the park, but it was pulled over on the side of the road and had his hood up. And then they, they spotted it again, and it was now leaving the park. And this time, it was leaving at a much higher rate of speed. So they made the report into police. Later that day as well, one of them recalled uh, seeing the 
the same car, the same license plate at the boat launch area. I believe it was around noon, uh, the same morning. The park rangers describe the vehicle as a collectible car. It is a 1970 Chevy Impala Lowrider, and they have the license plate number. The license plate number came back to an address in Vernon. She checked for the, the BC driver's license that's associated to that license plate. And she ran that and she goes, boy, I could just feel my heart pounding out of my chest when I seen the address show up uh, for the complex where Heather went missing that day. Uh, she, it was just an unbelievable uh, a feeling inside of her that, wow, now we have a suspect for the murder of Heather. Investigators are intrigued by the fact that the suspect changed his address from Vernon, B.C. to Cloverdale on October 2nd, the day after Heather's disappearance. Could this suspect be Heather Thomas's murderer? Or is it simply an extraordinary coincidence? On October 1st, 2000, the RCMP detachment in Surrey begins an investigation into the disappearance of 10-year-old Heather Thomas. The community has been part of a search unprecedented by any other in Canadian history. Over 1,200 volunteers participate. 21 days after Heather's disappearance, her body is recovered from Alouette Lake in Golden Ears Park, 35 kilometers from her father's home. An RCMP dispatcher remembers a report of a suspicious car in Golden Ears Park the day after Heather went missing. Investigators are surprised that the trace from the vehicle registration shows that the owner lives in the same complex as the young victim he becomes the primary suspect. I was pretty ecstatic at that time. Like, this was finally the first big lead in a case. Now, having said that, we have no evidence other than a car driving through the park. But to us, um, this was highly significant. And it just, like I say, we don't believe in coincidence too much. The suspect's name is Shane Ertmode, a construction worker in his early 20s, originally from Vernon, British Columbia. The investigation regains momentum. Chris Drotar revisits the reports gathered from Heather's housing complex. Shane Ertmode's name had surfaced three other times within our investigation. Uh, once on the night of the, the murder itself, when the initial canvas went out that night about midnight, um, he phoned into the RCMP detachment and reported his home had been broken into um, during the afternoon hours. The third time that Shane Ertmode's name surfaced was at the police checkpoint in the complex, just hours after Heather's disappearance. So we had Ertmode leaving his place, uh, his house. It was somewhere around five o'clock in the morning. Like, it was way out of character because he didn't start work until I think it was nine o'clock. So him leaving that early in the morning and then the security guards picking him up in, in Golden Ears Park at six, uh, 5.45 or six, six o'clock, somewhere around there, uh, it all fits. Like he's left his apartment to go back to Alouette Lake for some reason. Constable Alain Bouchard investigates an unrelated incident in the same complex. I went the day after Heather Thomas was reported missing. I went to the residence and I met with Mr. Erdmode. Bouchard was responsible for investigating a burglary that Shane Erdmode reported to the RCMP. When I arrived, I noticed the apartment had been cleaned. The carpet had been vacuumed and when I came down the stairs, I noticed football equipment on the floor, as if a bag had been emptied out. So at the time, I asked Mr. Ertmode if they had stolen his bag. Burglars often use sports bags or suitcases they find at the scene to carry their stolen goods. I looked everywhere in his townhouse and I asked him what had been stolen. He told me, only cash. There was absolutely nothing else missing. Only money was missing. At that point, I looked for what might be a point of entry into the residence. 
There was a window right next to the sliding door in the bedroom, and it looked like there was a print from the palm of a hand on the window. Again, I asked Mr. Erdmode if anything else had been stolen, and he told me no. I found this a little bit strange because he had a television, a VCR, he had a baseball card collection and a hockey card collection, and neither of which had been touched. And naturally, those are the kinds of things that could easily have been stolen. But what captures Constable Bouchard's attention is how nervous Ertmode is. He was always next to me, asking me a lot of questions about the work I was doing. He was always at my side to the point where I had to ask him to move over so that I could take photographs. He never left me alone in any part of the residence. He literally followed me from the time I knocked at the door to the time I left. He was always right beside me. Bouchard's intuition tells him to document more than usual for a complaint of break and enter. His detailed report lands on Peter Cross's desk. What we had was uh, a possible fellow who was in the park that comes from the complex. So that's it. Um, obviously at a weird time of day, obviously there's got to be some explanation. But other than that, we had nothing. He's the only person, and the number is astronomical, uh, of the potential suspects. We go from, I'll say, 600 people that, that you know, are potentials to Erdmode. He's the only one that has a connection to Heather Thomas. So my thought was the only advantage we have at this time was the element of surprise. So he can't know that we're coming. How do you do that? Well, you have to go into a covert kind of mode. The other thing is we didn't know anything about him. Um, so part of the thought process now was we have somebody that has killed a child living in the complex, surrounded by children. Um, so the public safety factor is now off the scale. Peter Cross orders 24-hour surveillance of Ertmo to ensure the suspect does not reoffend. He also asks for a covert warrant to search and gather evidence from Ertmo's apartment. We're going to seize his vehicle, we're going to search his home, we're going to dig up all the background that we can on, on Mr. Ertmo to see who he is and maybe he has propensity for this type of crime. The covert warrant is served on the suspect's home. Constable Bouchard leads the team because he has already been inside Ertmode's townhouse. When the forensic team went in there, like, they were looking for fingerprints and uh, hair, and fiber, her clothing, you know, maybe her DNA if she had touched something. I did what we call taping. Now, taping is when you take a piece of packaging tape and then you get down on the carpet. You're looking for clothing fibers. We look for hair. You look for anything that may have fallen on the floor. We found his little treasure trove of mementos. He had a shoebox full of, he had the gas receipt. He had um, his registration uh, from uh, Re renewing his driver's license on the 2nd of October, which was perfect because now we had a photograph of how he looked that day when all of our witnesses saw him in the park. There were two receipts that were very interesting. One was a receipt from Colossus Movie Theater in Langley, where he had bought a ticket to go to see the movie The Exorcist. The other was a gas receipt from a garage just across the street from the theater in Langley. The operation is successful. The receipts are evidence that Ertmode was trying to create an alibi. We're thinking this is great stuff, you know, now we know his story, like this is going to be his play that no, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, and here's my, here's my evidence. Investigators let Ertmode believe that his car has been stolen. Constable Bouchard gets to work searching the vehicle in the RCMP's Surrey garage. The inside of the car was very clean. When I started to take the carpet out, I discovered that the sub-carpet was completely soaked. It was so soaked that when I squeezed it, water poured out. It was completely saturated with water. I found that troubling. At that point, I began to look at the vehicle to see if there was a leak somewhere like the windshield. 
One experiment I tried to do was I sat in the car and I asked one of my partners to take a water hose and to spray down the car. What I noticed was that it wasn't leaking. So that indicates that somebody brought the water into the car. I think probably to clean the carpets. So it almost like it had been power washed in the inside. Um, it just showed he's gone through a very thorough process to, to clean this car out. Constable Parks has found a forensic botanist to analyze the plant fragments found in the girl's hair and the sports bag. He sends the samples to Dr. Ralph Matthews at Simon Fraser University. All of the compartments had some plant material and sand and material in it. The main compartment had some quite large pieces of twigs and, and greeny, leafy material at the bottom. There's a very common evergreen fern that is very common in the coastal rainforests around the lower mainland area and Golden Years Park called Christmas fern, or the Latin name is Polysticum munitum. And I saw some pieces of that. There were also some leaf fragments that looked like their typical sort of salmonberry type um, leaves and twigs, ferns material, some moss material. And the other thing was uh, part of the botanical was charred wood, so burnt wood. Now the forest around Alouet Lake had been logged some 80 years previous, so it, even though people figure it's, it's old growth or ancient forest, it's a cedar jungle. So when it's logged, it got burnt off, so there is charcoal around there. I wasn't expecting to find anything burnt in there. It sounded like someone scooped up something from the ground or from a log that had been burnt. Dr. Matthews did his PhD studies in Golden Ears Park, so he is very familiar with the vegetation around Alouet Lake. He identified 13 varieties of botanical, whether they be seeds, plants, uh, or, or mosses and uh, grasses. He said they're all from the forest around Alouette Lake except this juniper. So there's 13, including the juniper, 12 that are native to that area of the lake or the park. So I said, well, that's nice to know, but that's just like every other forest around the lower mainland. And he said, no, to have 12 different plant varieties coexist in one small location is where your probability gets astronomically um, great. Investigators verify the receipts found in Shane Ertmote's apartment. A movie ticket is of particular interest. Turns out there's 26 video cameras inside for security. So we went back and we actually had an officer go through in real time 12 hours of footage for 26 video cameras and we were able to say at the end of it that he bought a ticket it was a ticket for this show at this show but we could categorically say he never entered that theater or he never came out of that theater so he's got three different alibis that he's purported separately and you know one he's got a gas receipt he's filling his car up with gas the other one is he's at a movie and then the other one is that he was out and somebody broke into his house could make all these connects, even though they are circumstantial, they're still connects that relate him right back to the crime. All of the evidence found in Ertmode's apartment is circumstantial. Will Peter Cross and his team risk an arrest without direct evidence? In Cloverdale, British Columbia, an investigation that is unprecedented in Canadian history is underway following the disappearance of a 10-year-old girl. On October 22, 2000, a body is recovered from the waters of Alouette Lake. Using dental records, the body is identified as Heather Thomas. A report made by Golden Ears Park Rangers leads the RCMP to the owner of a suspicious vehicle seen in the park shortly after Heather's disappearance. The suspect, Shane Ertmode, is placed under 24-hour surveillance while an undercover forensic team searches his apartment with a fine-toothed comb. Investigators gather numerous pieces of circumstantial evidence. Shane Ertmode's arrest is looming. Unexpectedly, Ertmode moves out of the complex in Cloverdale just a few days after the discovery of Heather's body. 
I rented the apartment for a period of time and said, here, go to it. Um, sure to go through. So it gave the forensic team initially that went in time to go through the entire apartment even more thoroughly than they did before. I was able to find a print, a very small fingerprint, indicating to me that it came from a small person, either a child or somebody with small hands. I photographed it, and I lifted the print, and then I sent it to our database. However, one of the unfortunate things about children is that they don't sweat very much, so they don't leave a lot of fingerprints on surfaces. Constable Bouchard and his colleagues spend several days in Ertmode's old apartment. Unfortunately, we weren't able to identify any traces of DNA belonging to Heather. On November 3rd, 2000, two weeks after the discovery of Heather Thomas's body, Peter Cross obtains an arrest warrant for Shane Ertmode. There's no shortage of volunteers to, to finally arrest him. Basically, we stopped the car. I went out on the pastor side, opened the door, and, and told her he was under arrest for the murder of Heather Thomas, uh, to which he replied. He looked over at his driver, and he said, is this a joke? And then uh, just that kept going on, this is a joke, you know, and I just pulled him out of the car and said, no joke. Ertmode is taken to the Surrey detachment of the RCMP to be interviewed. He's held overnight for questioning the next day. He didn't say much for about three hours, four hours. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, you got me. Basically, he asked Heather if she wanted to see some pictures of birds. He entices her into a, a, his place. He basically starts taking her clothes off and gets her clothes off to a certain extent. At this point, she's starting to scream, I think. He puts his hand over her face to the point that she suffocates and dies. Now, the thing that's, that is probably troublesome to people listening to this is it takes about 90 seconds, a minute and a half, to kill somebody this way. Now he's in a bit of a panic, and uh, he doesn't know what to do. He dumps out his hockey bag or sports bag, puts her inside the bag, carries her out. Um, he then put her in the back seat of the of the vehicle and drove out. He starts driving up there, he needs gas, he pulls into the gas station. At what point he formulates the plan to buy a ticket for a movie. So he's contemplating his alibi at this time. He then drives over to Maple Ridge and yeah, ends up in the Golden Ears Park and throws her into the wooded area I'd say two or three miles inside the park boundary. He'd stuffed her in a hollowed out log that was burnt, and then he had, he had confessed to tearing up everything that he could find to cover it and hide the body. So he used uh, leaf litter, salmon berries, ferns, everything. He was just stripping them and throwing them into this hollowed out log to cover the body up. Ertmode leaves skid marks alongside the road to mark the spot so he can return to move the body. The next morning, just as Constable Cross had suspected, Ertmode returns to the park and moves the victim a second time. Gets her into the car and then down to the boat ramp where he puts the bag with her still in it inside the, the boat and paddles his way around. So he's out of sight of the boat launch, so nobody can see him actually throwing the bag in the water and puts the bag in the water. There's about 15 key points from his confession that overlap perfectly with the investigation. He explains everything as to how that plant material got there, right, and why it would be there. So it was very telling. You know, nobody's going to falsely confess to this stuff is going to be able to hit those kind of details. 
Ertmode's confession explains where he hid the body before dumping it into the lake. Jeff Parks and Dr. Matthews return to Golden Ears Park to attempt to find the spot. If the body was hidden, it should be somewhere within walking distance of here. And I spent several hours walking through the forest, carefully looking for evidence that I could link with what I'd seen in the bag. And uh, he found exactly the spot. He actually found the, the log that Ertmo stuffed her in, a hollowed out log that was burnt. Literally everything that was in the bag, except for one thing, was found right within maybe 10 meters, a, a small area. And it was a perfect spot, a little cavity hidden behind a log. Dr. Matthews finds 12 of the 13 plant varieties identified in the sports bag all in the same area at Alouette Lake. The probability of all 12 of these botanicals existing in one little area, it's like, wow, that's like a miracle. But Dr. Matthews still cannot place the 13th specimen. These two little juniper fragments were definitely not of a native juniper, so they couldn't have come from the Golden Ears Park because they don't grow there. Is this last specimen the missing piece of evidence needed to confirm that Ertmode is the murderer? The massive search for 10-year-old Heather Thomas has ended. The missing person's case is now a homicide investigation. The shifting water levels of Alouette Lake reveal her lifeless body, 35 kilometers from her home. A vintage car is reported in the park the day after Heather's disappearance. A trace of the license plate leads RCMP to the prime suspect. Shane Ertmode lived in the same townhouse complex as the victim. He is placed under 24-hour surveillance while investigators gather evidence. After his arrest, Ertmode confesses to the murder. Dr. Matthews has spent months trying to locate the origin of the 13th plant sample found in the sports bag. Then he sees a clue in a media report. That made me think, oh gosh, you know, if somebody had taken a hockey bag and was dragging it through these bushes, that would be a great way for little bits to sort of jump off the bush where they're brittle and dry and pop into one of these, pop into the bag. That's when everything clicked in place, like that's how the juniper got in there. That hockey bag top zipper was torn open, and that's exactly how that stuff got in the bag. And Jeff Parks and I agreed that the diddling Golden Ears Park, the bag, with the ultimate suspect. More than two years after Heather's death, her murderer goes on trial. The prosecution's case is built on Shane Ertmode's confession and a lot of circumstantial evidence. Will they succeed in convincing a jury that Shane Ertmode is guilty of first-degree murder? You are portraying a set of circumstances that makes a jury or a judge believe that there is no other possibility as to what happened. Uh, other than the circumstances and the, what you've laid out. So when you think of all the possible pitfalls in that, um, is that what, if one piece of the puzzle gets shaken, then the credibility of the entire puzzle falls apart. The trial lasts five months. Hundreds of exhibits are shown. Dozens of testimonials are heard. On August 29, 2002, the jury retires to deliberate. So we're fully expecting the verdict to be a day or two or three uh, down the road, well, it came back in hours. He was found guilty of first degree murder. Automatic life sentence uh, with no chance of parole for 25 years. For investigators, volunteers, and the prosecutors who work tirelessly, the verdict is bittersweet.